welcome back to the class again um, in this class we are going to discuss a very uh, important sociologist very interesting sociologist professor andre bethe who was born in 1934 and uh, he was born to a, a french father and an indian mother and um, you know his work uh, on indian <coughs> village is considered to be a pioneering uh, one so uh, bethe is somebody whom uh, we we need to uh, discuss uh, 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 at length so we are devoting one session uh, for him and uh, one of the foremost theorists of social stratification in india and one of the most important uh, you know contributions of uh, bethe is his uh, theorization of indian uh, society on the basis of social stratification and also not uh, following a structural functionalist perspective okay so let me also make it very clear that uh, bethe does not belong to the school Uh, the typical uh, school like sinvas who followed a structural functionalist uh, perspective rather bethe uh, adopted the theoretical formulation of social stratification as presented by max weber and uh, worked extensively on uh, themes such as caste inequality and stratification and employed a weberian approach to the analysis of social change and social stratification um, he was a student of emin sinvas uh, in studied uh, in delhi university received a phd from there and then taught at distinct universities like oxford university cambridge university chicago university and london school of economics and then uh, also taught in various uh, prestigious departments in the country so considered to be very important uh, scholar and these are some of his important uh, books uh, caste class and power changing patterns of social stratification in a tanjore village and this is uh, again considered to be a classic work uh, on indian society so any sociology student who does a, a course on indian society uh, will be made to read this or they have to ensure that they are familiar with his work and then other essays and books including caste old and new essays in social structure and social stratification inequality and social change six essays on comparative sociology social and cultural reproduction of caste kinship and occupation in india the backward classes in contemporary india uh, and antimonies of society essays on ideologies and institutions sociology essays on approaches and methods so these are some of his important uh, works now bethe developed uh, a sociology of caste different from that of sinvas and dumo so this is uh, you know louis dumo uh, whom we are going to discuss extensively in the coming week uh, we will have i think uh, some uh, three or four lectures on dumo uh, very elaborate lectures on louis dumo and the sinvas already we have uh, discussed so the uh, important thing about bethe is that bethe developed a, a, a unique perspective uh, in difference or 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 in in, in opposition to that of uh, provided by uh, sinvas and dumo replacing sinvas's interest in social structure and the process of such as westernization and sanskritization with a focus on weber's social stratification he developed a new conceptual approach to make sense of social change in india so uh, i hope uh, you by now you are familiar with the argument that emin sinvas followed a structural functionalist perspective which basically looked at how social institutions work and how social institutions complement each other how they contribute uh, to the overall stability of the system so as i have repeatedly mentioned structural functionalism is preoccupied with the question of social stability or social equilibrium okay. so it has a it has an inherent bias towards that towards Uh, exploring and inquiring about the how a society maintains itself and uh, bethe moves away from that and he basically wants to understand social change in india and as a as a general theory we have discussed uh, structural functionalism is not effective in addressing the phenomenon of social change okay though uh, you know parson uh, in his latter writing tried to incorporate that in general uh, structural functionalism is seen as a theory not sensitive enough or not capable enough to explain why and how social changes take place because it is preoccupied with the question of how society maintains itself and it has an ideological and even maybe even 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 a bias towards that on the other hand bethe wanted to understand social change and he used the weberian concept uh, of of stratification and weberian concept of stratification as you might know it was majorly different from that of karl marx who looked at social stratification primarily on the basis of class so if the marxian perspective was class alone okay because marx believed that all other forms of stratification like 
say differences in social status, difference in power, differences in ritual status, all these things can be subsumed under class. Whereas for Weber, stratification is a combination of both class, political power and ritual status. Okay, so Weber has a more exhaustive or a more comprehensive analysis of social stratification. He believes that in every society, people are divided uh, into different uh, strata on the base of all these combination of people. For Whereas Marx, in a, in, a, in a crude sense, he refused to recognize beyond a point the salience of power and ritual status, which he believed uh, were subsumed under the uh, overarching category of class. So he wanted to look into that. Bethe understands caste as a form of social stratification and focuses primarily on the material interest that caste simultaneously inhabits and also makes possible. Okay, so uh, Bethe was rather interested in a kind of a material dimension of caste, the material factors that, uh, you know, make that provide salience to caste uh, and the kind of a material interest that caste actually represent. So uh, he was less, of course, he was concerned, but he was less concerned with the question of ritual purity and pollution, maybe unlike Dumo whom we are going to meet. Because when we are discussing Dumo next class, we, we will see that how Dumo was completely preoccupied with the whole question of ritual uh, purity and pollution. For him, material conditions were kind of epiphenomena. They were kind of, you know, residual in their character, but for Bethe, they were central. He also launched a sharp critique of Dumontian sociology, uh, which uh, you are not yet familiar, but we are discussing it from the coming class. Dumont's work by concentrating on the structures of traditional Indian society and the holism and hierarchy in it left out many of the issues that are of the concern of modern India, material interest, economic and political and inequality. Uh, and uh, this point will become more clearer after next week. Uh, Louis Dumont uh, gave so much of importance to the uh, ritual dimension and he did not look at caste as a system of stratification. He was not much bothered about its undesirable uh, you know, uh, consequences of caste. He, he basically looked at it as a uh, purely from a theoretical perspective, arguing that it is uh, yet another form of, uh, uh, it should not be conflated with inequality. That was his very strange argument. It is, um, uh, it is a different form of, of uh, you know, society that people must understand the kind of values behind it. But uh, Bethe was more clearer that caste system is an example of social stratification with very specific material implications or material side effects. He uh, does not dismiss the importance of Dumont's structural approach of, to caste, which is concerned with values and ideas, but only provides a comprehensive framework for studying material interest and changing social relations to understand caste from a different perspective as a form of stratification, as I mentioned. So uh, he does not dismiss the importance of ritual hierarchy, okay, which nobody does. But uh, the way in which uh, Dumo went about uh, reducing almost everything else into ritual hierarchy was very problematic. That is identified by Bethe and uh, Madan and um, you know a lot of other people. A lot of other people also had issue with uh, uh, Srinivas, sorry, with uh, Dumo because he uh, was not um, open enough or, or, or he did not really kind of acknowledge sufficiently the kind of inhuman uh, aspects of uh, caste system in India. For him, he, he tried to be a very distanced or, or, or dispassionate observer of the whole reality that, rather than uh, being sympathetic or being, uh, uh, you know, uh, touched by the stories of these uh, people who are excluded. Caste, class and power, changing patterns of social stratification in a Tanjavur village. This is, a, this, as I mentioned, it's one of the important works. So, Bethe's perspective uh, uh, on caste from the fieldwork of social stratification is well articulated in this work. This is a work, is a revised version of his doctoral thesis based on his fieldwork in Sripuram. Again, it's a pseudo name, a village in Tanjore, uh, Tamil Nadu in 1961 and 62. As um, we discussed in the previous class, uh, most of this uh, or almost every uh, anthropologist use pseudo names. Uh, they would give only very broad indications to, uh, to, to, to give some idea about where it is geographically located, mostly the name of the region or the district, but they would desist from giving very specific uh, uh, illustrations about what, which exactly is a village because uh, of concerns about privacy and, and, and uh, uh, other things. So he explored the process of social change in Sripuram through three important social structures, the caste structure, the class system and the distribution of power within that. Okay. So um, 
it is a more structured uh, analysis of a village. Uh, he looks at the caste structure as what uh, Sri would have, uh, Srinivas would have did. He also looks at the class system, okay, looking into the ownership of land and, and uh, other things and also the distribution of power within it. Okay. So for Srinivas, the latter two were not central to his, uh, his theorization and as I mentioned, it was a more readable, uh, something like a novel-like uh, book, this uh, remembered village, whereas uh, Bethes is a more systematic, rigorous account of this uh, village, Sripuram. Identified that change is a fundamental feature of the social structure of the village and provided an analytical scheme to understand social change. You know, uh, this again is something very uh, interesting because Indian villages were seen as uh, a place of no change in the colonial accounts. Indian villages were seen as isolated, Indian villages were seen as static, Indian villages were seen as unchanging, as if they were kind of frozen in, in time. And this colonial account of Indian villages as the place of stability, place of, of, of known change was very, very influential. And uh, Bethe argues that that is not the case, especially after, uh, uh, you know, westernization, after the influence of modernity, there are rapid changes happening in the villages as well. The categories of caste, class and power refer to the different forms of social stratification as we mentioned. Uh, it directly follows, follows Weberian, uh, you know, engagement with the uh, Marxian understanding of uh, stratification. Uh, Weber actually engages with the ghost of Marx as we, we, we know uh, on several uh, aspects about the nature of stratification, about the importance of religion, uh, importance of ideologies and, and host of things. And, and of course, Weber comes up with a more uh, comprehensive analysis of social stratification. Now, caste. Stratification based on caste assumed greater importance than those of class and power. So, Bethe agrees that, that, that caste as a, as a social structure, as an institution was far more uh, powerful than that of the uh, power and class. The village was divided into Brahmin, non-Brahmin and Adi Dravida and it was the fundamental cleavage in its social structure. So, the village of course is a multicaste village uh, and every uh, big multicaste villages in South India would ideally, uh, you know, uh, represents caste between 10 to 20. 10 to 20 uh, caste would ideally be present in almost every large multicaste villages in uh, South India. So, Sripuram also was not uh, different. And the major three divisions were Brahmin, the non-Brahmins and the Adi Dravidas. Adi Dravidas are the uh, you know, ex-untouchable or, or the untouchables who are concerned, who, who belong, who fell outside the Varna system. In Weberian terms, caste constitutes status groups which are normally communities, often of an amorphous kind. Weber. Caste as a status group are defined essentially in terms of styles of life, assigned specific roles, ritual values and economic positions. Uh, something that we are familiar with, how castes uh, operate uh, in specific uh, rural setting. Uh, it's based on their styles of life, okay, the, the, the culinary uh, uh, dietary forms and then rituals, practices, customs which are very distinct from others and social roles, uh, assigned specific social roles including occupation, including uh, things that are prohibited, things are permitted. So, every aspect of social life seems to be uh, kind of regulated by, uh, by the influence of caste ritual values and economic positions. Then class, uh, another a universal category, if caste is something confined to uh, India or South Asia, class is a more broader universal category. Although some scholars consider class not as a form of social stratification, but in terms of social conflict. See, Darendorf, Darendorf is a, uh, you know, uh, Marxian scholar uh, who, who argues that uh, caste need not be always seen on the basis of the material basis, but on the basis of the position that they adopt at the time of stratification. Bethe argues that in the context of Sripuram, landlords, tenants and agricultural laborers form the rank order of class, which is more or less tacitly recognized by all. So on the one hand, you have Brahmins, then you have uh, no, non-Brahmin upper caste, and then you, the, you have the Adi Dravidas. And uh, this, is this is caste, and when it comes to class, you have uh, landlords, then you have tenants, and then you have agricultural laborers. Okay, very threefold stratification in class as well. Then a very few a number of people who own large amount of land, uh, and then uh, more number of people who work as the tenants 
in 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 their land of the landlords and then a uh, more number of people who work as landless laborers okay who do not own any land but who work in the land of either the tenants and that of the landlords and they work as the major three uh, uh, you know classes which form the rank order in the context of the agrarian social structure of sripuram classes are hierarchically arranged social categories based on broadly upon ownership or non ownership of the means of production and this is how you know caste uh, class is always defined this is a classical marxian definition that uh, class is defined not on the basis of the wealth that you own of course the the wealth is a by product of that but class is defined as the ownership of the means of production okay bourgeoisie is a class that owns the means of production and proletariat is the class that who do not own the means of production of course the old uh, marxian framework which uh, has lost its kind of analytical rigor in at least in, in in modern industrial societies but when it comes to an agrarian society like sripuram this definition is very very important okay those who own the means of production and those who do not own the means of production they are subdivided in terms of the types of ownership and control the types of services contributed to the process of production based on this a distinction between rentiers farmers cultivators sharecroppers and agricultural laborers can be made out but only at the conceptual level they do not in reality comprise a discrete group since it is frequently found that a single person is both a rentier and a farmer a sharecropper and a agricultural laborer etc so the categories about uh, as cannot be seen as you know uh, absolutely exclusive or watertight compartments uh, because uh, there is so much of you know fluidity between that a person could be uh, also a sharecropper but also can be an agricultural laborer a person can be a rentier and also a farmer so it's not that a farmer who uh, somebody who only rents out his land for uh, you know others to uh, cultivate that but he uh, himself you know participate in this whole cultivation then comes the third dimension that of power uh, the distribution of power produces a hierarchy that is distinct from hierarchies of caste and class this is a very fascinating um, uh, argument uh, how uh, does political power okay operate in a village setting is it a product of ritual hierarchy is it a product of class position is it a product of you know uh, ownership of land or is it more is it something more that's it's a very very fascinating uh, uh, question because power is something that is not uh, can be theorized that uh, easily if you remember uh, weberian definitions of charisma charismatic power or charismatic authority um, anybody with uh, out any of the conventional qualities can assume charismatic power uh that is a you know beauty of charismatic power so how does power uh, operate in a village setting is what uh, uh, he tries to understand power has the more fluid character than caste or class as there is continuous shifts in the power structure for this reason it is not easy to define power adequately in terms of formal criteria okay so uh, how do uh, how does a particular person how do, or how do a group of people uh, obtain power retain power uh, is a, is a question Uh, that is more complicated than uh, to understand the ritual position of different castes because ritual position is more or less stable as we have seen and class position is also more predictable easily uh, you know uh, you, you can conceptualize easily but power is much more fluid however here power following the weber is considered as the chance of a man or a number of men to realize their own will in a communal action even against the resistance of others who are participant in the action uh you know the, the typical uh, weberian definition of uh, power that the ability of a person to impose his will over others despite their resistance that's a, a classical weberian definition of power now power can be based on ownership and control of land the support of numerically preponderant groups these are the two important sources of uh, you know power in a village setting one is ownership and control of land uh, we have discussed in this in in the previous class when we talked about uh, dominant caste because dominance the ability to dominate others emerges from the fact that you have the ownership of large tracts of land on which other people are dependent on their livelihood okay uh, in many occasions uh, one of the easiest way to punish a end section of people was to deny them the opportunity to work or to tell that you are no longer employed in my land uh, hereafter okay and 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 that would put that put those people into severe hardship because their only livelihood uh, source of their livelihood was to work in the land and then get the meager 
uh, remuneration that they would get in the form of grains or maybe uh, some other kinds. So, so, so ownership of land is not only provide you with uh, money and resources and wealth, but also it gives you a very important means to exert control over others. And the support of numerically preponderant group. This is another important source of power, especially in a democratic setup where uh, your, your political uh, importance is based on the votes that you garner. However, many features of power structure cannot be seen in terms of hierarchical arrangements. There is a conflict between two political parties and others. So, at the same time, uh, many features of power structure cannot be seen in terms of hierarchical ar arrangements. So, this hierarchy is not very clear and also you will find uh, that maybe two people belong to the same dominant group might belong to two different uh, you know uh, political parties and the factionalism can be a major issue in that. So, uh, things are much more complicated. Caste, class and power and analysis. Uh, class unlike caste is open principle and practice. One may change one's position from the tenant to landowner, uh, from agricultural labourer to owner cultivator. So, uh, Bethe records this transition okay, of people uh, from uh, agricultural labourer to owner cultivator so that mobility is possible. In the past till the end of 19th century, the landowner as well as the agricultural labourers formed a more or less closed category as the only way of acquiring land was by inheritance. Okay. Again, very, very important point uh, that uh, for a large part of human history, of, of, of Indian history, uh, ownership of land was based on inheritance. Okay. You, uh, to a large extent, I am not saying completely, uh, to a large extent, especially uh, looking into the communities that are traditionally seen as land owning castes and the communities who are seen as landless uh, communities. However, in the mid uh, 20th century, by 1950s, the movement between different agriculture classes in Tripuram accelerated due to considerable buying and selling of land. Okay? This also is connected with the larger story of migration of people. Migration of rural, uh, uh, migration of upper caste people, especially land owning Brahmins from uh, rural hinterlands into main cities, main cities of Trichy, of Chennai, of Madurai, where they uh, began to uh, embrace modern education and then uh, get into modern occupations or modern jobs that are offered by the colonial government as well as the post-colonial government. So that completely, uh, to a large extent, changed the village structure. In traditional society, there was much greater consistency between the class system and the caste structure. Class system was largely subsumed under caste structure. As we mentioned, the kind of a correspondence between these two structures of caste. Okay? Uh, However, the relationship between caste structure and class system is dynamic in modern society. The changes in the caste system due to westernization and sanskritization and in the class system due to extension of, of cash economy, the emergence of new caste free occupations and the coming of land into the market have contributed to the disso dissociating class relations from the caste structure. Okay? So, a series of factors, the emergence of cash economy which uh, you know brought in revolutionary changes and then emergence of new caste free occupations, uh, a, a host of new entrepreneurship, host of new craft, new job opportunities, new you know industries emerged which were kind of uh, caste free, okay, which were not uh, connected with the traditional understanding of caste and coming of land into the market. Uh, land was transferred not only through inheritance but land was avail available in the open market because many of the upper caste people who wanted to move to the uh, to the urban centers wanted to dispose of the caste of, of the land and the land was freely available in the market uh, to be bought by people who have money so in a in in the logic of a market caste sentiments hardly matter so this land was given away or or it was it was given to the highest bidder who had money and several castes by then in ram in sripura village had uh, assumed had had made good fortunes uh, by uh, various other crafts and other business engagement and they were able to buy land from these people. Despite the overlap, one can still achieve a variety of class positions uh, with different degrees of prob probability, whatever one's position in the caste structure may be. Uh, very important argument. There was a rapid change happening in the distribution of power in village system. Okay, uh, That is very important argument about how uh, uh, this this uh, transition of, of power was happening. Unlike caste and class, power has shifted 
much more decisively from the traditional elites of the village into the hands of the new popular political leaders. Okay? Traditionally, the village sarpanj or village uh, chief or village uh, headman always belong to a traditional, uh, a couple of influential families of obviously of upper caste. Now that has moved away from a uh, you know, given closed limited set of families of, of caste into much more into pol popular political leaders who uh, can come from many other castes. Okay? And if the land owning groups were the powerful families in the past, new basis of power has emerged have emerged in modern society which is independent of caste class ties the strength of numerical support okay so the numerical support can be garnered on the basis of various attributes uh, caste ID identity caste affiliation is only one among them and you will see uh, you know political party party ideology is becoming important where uh, party ideologies are able to uh, garner support from across the caste groups uh, certain, for example, the, the International Congress or, or BJP for Manthet or, or, or Communist Party for that matter, were able to appeal to a wide variety of caste positions on, on various permutations and combinations. So, the, uh, the, the power, political power was of course is based on your popular support. This popular support is not directly uh, a, a product of your caste affiliation, that is the argument. Power is no longer a monopoly of any single caste in the village. The emergence of the Panjaj system, parties and political network has constituted new locus of power distinct from the caste and class. It was largely due to the political modernization of India. A familiar story to us, but it's worth reiterating that the electoral democracy and the grassroots democracy that has established in India uh, through Panjaiti Raj uh, has revolutionized okay, to a large extent and has altered the traditional uh, power structure in the villages. The traditional village system was made up largely of systems of groups and categories whose boundaries were relatively clear and well defined. However, the social change induced by various socio-economic and political factors has blurred the contours of this traditional system and contributed to the emergence of a new system. As, I, as we mentioned, to a large extent, they were rather stable. The caste and uh, class position were stable, but a host of uh, process of modernity has kind of a scrambled or at least disrupted this particular system to a large extent. Social mobility, economic change and political modernization in modern society have formed not only new economic and political relations but also new values, attitudes and aspirations. Uh, it, it goes without saying that uh, new uh, ideas and values and attitudes and aspirations with respect to say family relations, with respect to marriage, with respect to gender roles, with respect to religion, caste, everything, okay, Indian, Indian rural uh, world is witnessing a kind of a rapid transformation. Change has become the fundamental feature of modern society. So uh, this is, is a kind of a, uh, you know, a summary of uh, uh, Bethe's argument and uh, mostly explicating his work on uh, on this Tanjavur village, caste, class and power, as I mentioned. Uh, it provides a very fascinating, very powerful uh, view on a, a more comprehensive picture of the of, of a village setting whereby analyzing these three distinct features of caste uh, of a village that is caste, class and power and also focusing on the rapid changes that are happening, um, Bethe was able to provide a much more nuanced and, 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 and fascinating picture of transformations that are happening in the uh, rural areas. And these are the main references that are used uh, for this uh, essay or some of the important works. Uh, Ramesh Bairi, Being Brahmin, Being Modern, then Andre Bethe, Caste, Class and Power, then Bethe's own work, Society and Politics, then Darendorf, Ral Darendorf, uh, Class and Class Conflict in Indian Society, Max Weber, from Max Weber Essays in Sociology. So these are familiar uh, references. So uh, I am uh, winding up the class today and um, we will move to the next class, that is the Structuralism and uh, uh, Louis Dumont from the next week. Okay. So see you then. Thank you.